Hi, I'm Michael Cashew. And I'm Adi Cashew, and you're listening to The WAG Podcast. This podcast is about health, wellness, and personal development. Each episode is a short conversation between Adi and I on a single topic with actionable steps. We cover everything from food, mindset, fitness, and relationships. We started WAG because of the way health and fitness changed our lives, so we hope to share a tool or two that helps you along your way. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Welcome back, guys. I was holding my breath, just like waiting to see how you were going to open it to see if it happens at the either like the hello, hello or welcome back, guys. <laughs> she's ha- she's pleased with herself. <laughs> guys, we're, we're pumped to be here today. Hope you're having a great day wherever you are. And today I wanted to talk about something that is a hot topic in our household because we are complete opposites sometimes when it comes to food. And it's the abstainer versus moderator concept. So we'll get into that in a second. Before we get started, uh, I want to thank everyone that has taken the time to leave us a review on iTunes or Spotify. It's really motivating to us and it helps us reach more people. So huge shout out to you. Also, if you want to have one of your questions answered on the show, you can go to workingagainstgravity.com forward slash podcast, scroll down to the start recording button, and you can leave us a little voicemail. So if you have a question about personal development, nutrition, relationships, business, whatever whatever you want to learn from us, we would love to share our experience with you. And so just leave a nice, concise message with your name, where you're from, and we'll answer it here on the show. Yeah. I hope you guys have been liking those episodes too. Leave us a review and let us know what you've taken from it. So let's do this. So abstainer versus a moderator. Adi, can you explain that concept for us a little bit? Yeah. So we're going to be talking about it specifically in relation to food, but like most things in nutrition, it can be related to anything. An abstainer is somebody who does better, I don't want to say needs, but does better, meaning can stick to their promises, can maintain integrity, can have healthy behaviors and habits when they completely abstain from a particular behavior or a particular item. In this case, let's use the example of food, which would be chocolate. So abstaining meaning staying away from, don't have it near them, don't eat any of it, don't have a little bit of it, don't smell it. Like It can go as extreme as just not having this in your environment at all. That would be completely abstaining from chocolate because if you have a little bit or it's in your environment, often that is like a trigger for an abstainer, which meaning they might eat more than they want to or more than what aligns with the kind of person they want to be or their goals. And that spirals often into other behaviors. So I have a little bit of chocolate. I think most people can relate to this scenario where you have a little bit of chocolate, you go, you take a little, you take a serving, you go to like a different room and you have, you have a little bit of chocolate, but in the back of your mind, you know how much is left. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh, I could have a little bit more. And then you go back and you have a little bit more. And then eventually all the chocolate's gone and you had no intention of eating all the chocolate, but now you've eaten all the chocolate and you're like, oh, I could probably eat that whole bag of chips over there now. And so it spirals and goes into either some type of binging behavior or just behavior that doesn't align with your goals in the moment. Yeah. Or they, or just like me, I make this commitment over and over and over. Like I'm not going to have sugar or I'm not going to have a certain amount of sugar, or I'm going to stay away from gluten, or I'm not going to have food after 8 PM. And I make these promises to myself. And so often I break those promises, Mm -hmm. right? Because I'm I'm an abstainer. I do, mm-hmm. I do with most things, I do a lot better with like hard and fast lines. Mm-hmm. So how does someone determine which they are? Well, we need to talk about what a moderator is first. Oh, it's a moderator. <laughs> so a moderator is somebody who can have a little bit and doesn't feel the same pulls and urges after having a little bit of something to continue participating in behaviors that don't align with who you want to be in your goals. So they can have a little bit of chocolate and leave the rest in the fridge. And they're not... I don't feel like a moderator is actively resisting going back to the fridge. They are genuinely satisfied by having a little bit of chocolate and that has satisfied the little craving that they have and they feel okay with waiting 
you know, maybe till the next day or till next week to have it again. Mm -hmm. And they don't feel like I have to have the rest of it because it's, it's there and this is my last chance type of thing. Well, what do you think about this? I feel like it's, they still have the, the, the same mechanism is going on in their brain. It's just not as strong. Mm -hmm. And there, there's not the same pattern of, I feel a craving, like, in an abstainer, like someone like me, I have a craving, I satisfy the craving, and that pattern is reinforced. So they don't have that same pattern in their mind. It's, it, not, it's not as, as strong, strong. And there's there the satisfaction from fulfilling the craving lasts for longer. Mm -hmm. So it's like I'm fulfilled, moving on to the next thing. There's not this like preoccupation with the chocolate or the thing. Like mm -hmm you can have a little bit of chocolate and if there's still some around, you're still thinking about it. Mm -hmm. It's still there in your head where mo most moderators can have a little bit and they're like, okay, I'm now, that's gone. I know I'm going to be able to have it again. I'll have it another time, but it's gone now and I'm going to focus on to the next thing I want to do. Mm -hmm. There's still the, I, I'm sure there's still for some people that I would love to have more and the me right now wants to have more, but they can connect with the future version of themselves. Like, I'm just going to let that go because I really, the better version of me doesn't want more. Got it. I think another uh, important distinction or point about it is like abstainers tend to not do well with moderation and moderators tend to not do well with uh, abstaining from something, right? A moderator could feel like, overly restricted sure. by by completely abstaining and by the time like when they start eating the food again it has like an adverse reaction for them for sure so a moderator might completely abstain and then have a little bit of chocolate and that leads them to completely overindulge because they haven't had the chance to have it and uh -huh. it feels like this is going to be the only chance so uh -huh. a moderator would probably do better having a little bit every once in a while so how does someone decide which they are? We're going to talk about a little bit more about this later in the show, but I really don't think you are black and white abstainer or moderator. I think you can be both at the same time, and I think that you can be an abstainer versus moderator for different things. So maybe like chocolate is your trigger, but you're totally okay with just having some chips and you don't have the same behaviors. So what I would suggest for people trying to decide if they – are an abstainer or a moderator and that line of thinking is use they think it might be useful for them to help them get on the right track is notice your behaviors around if you can in the moment which is harder to do if not then after something has already happened like I've overeaten or I've let eating chocolate spiral me into eating chips and mac and cheese and ice cream and all these things and skipping my workout. If that happened, then look back and think about what was the initial situation, like what was the initial piece of food that, especially if this is happening consistently, then it might be worthwhile for you to abstain from that thing, at least for a period of time. If not, that's just like something that you don't eat and see how, just pay attention to your, to your patterns. When are you overindulging? When are you not doing the behaviors that you want to be doing? And is it being triggered by something? Mm -hmm. And if you can notice that you're totally okay having a little bit and it doesn't, you don't often completely spiral, then you might be a moderator. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's value in trying both for some I don't know, set period of time, like trying abstaining for two weeks, trying doing just a moderate, moderate approach for two weeks and reflecting on how they feel and reflecting on like, like the cravings and then the, the overall outcomes. There is always benefit to trying things for periods of time and reflecting on how you do with it. Trying it gives you more, like we are all about trying different things. I think there's benefits to trying different styles of diets. I think there's benefits to, you know, try keto or try this or try that. And so you can find out actually what works for you. It's really hard to make a decision based off of this conceptual information that we're talking about versus it might actually pan out differently for you when you're in it. You might feel like you might, you're a moderator, like, oh yeah, for sure I could have just a little bit and be fine. And then in action, it doesn't happen that way. Mm -hmm. Or you might be in a stressful period of your life. So it might tilt a little bit further to the abstainer side in this period of time. So I think 
it's always worth trying different things and seeing what works for you, mm-hmm. especially when it's a temporary. You're not, you're not like I'm going to be an abstainer for the rest of my life. And I think that's important in this episode to understand. We are not saying decide you're an abstainer <laughs> or decide you're a moderator, and that's just it forever. Mm-hmm. I think for those of you that have listened to multiple episodes, you would be surprised if we took that type of a stance. This is an evolving process of just becoming more self aware, mm-hmm. which helps you turn nutrition and fitness into a lifetime thing. And I think you have a great example of being an addict, like growing up an addict, and your perspective on that, I think, would be helpful too. So yeah, in AA, actually in the recovery community in general, there's this idea that once an addict, always an addict. And that worked really, really well for me up to a certain point for the first like five years. It helped me not take a single drop of alcohol or drug. And in that time, I was able to like really rewire my brain, deal with a lot of the underlying issues that caused me to drink and use drugs. But after a certain point, I didn't identify with that with the piece in Alcoholics Anonymous where they say, I am powerless over drugs and alcohol. Now I can socially and responsibly drink alcohol and it causes it's caused me zero issues in the last, I don't know, seven years. But it, t- it definitely took a, a long time of being completely abstinent. So I'm wondering, is there, is something, is there something similar in nutrition where it could, it could hold people back to put this stamp on themselves of I'm an abstainer because I'm like, I'm just addicted to whatever, whatever this is. Like the problem I see, uh, potential problem I see is people telling themselves that and then not continuing to do the work to find a place of moderation where they can have a little bit, but not all of something. I would be hesitant to say that that approach works for everybody because I do think that there are people out there that abstaining is just better for them. And that's going to be a better strategy long term and they'll be happier and there'll be less frustration and friction and less instances of feeling out of control. And that's that's probably possible. That's probably true in addiction too. Like that's probably true that there's some people that, you know, that they would – that abstaining is just the better decision for them. I do think there is a lot of people that are saying – that are taking that stance, like I'm abstaining and not doing the work to switch the power. So you're, you took, did the work and continue to do the work today of you having power over the substances that used to feel like they had power over you. And once that power shift has happened, then I think it's, it's, it flows. You can be more of a moderator in that situation because now you're in control versus you like taken time away. So when you're in it, chocolate is like, it's, it seems extreme to be talking this way about chocolate, but it does happen for a lot of people with all sorts of food. But if you're feeling like I have no control over my consumption of chocolate, the second I have it, I have no control. I just want to eat. I want to get rid of all of it in the house. And I just find any sweet kick I can f- possibly find. That's m- like the the sugar or the substance has some level of control over you. It feels like that at least. So taking some time completely away from it can help you realize why was I doing that? Was it that I was going through something in my life or was I just not taking care of my mental health? Am I now working out more? Am I doing more journaling and reflecting? And then now is there more opportunity for me to notice when that's happening so I can get back in control and then feeling like I can enjoy things moderately. Mm-hmm. I do think that it requires work for sure. But nutrition and fitness re- requires work. This is uh, this is something that we talk about a lot of something that saved you may no longer serve you. Mm-hmm. So abstaining might have might save you in the moment. Like I can, I now feel like I don't really want chocolate that much, or I don't feel like I need to binge, and then you end up in a situation where I also want to enjoy some moments with my friends or the moments of like birthday. And I feel like I can do that without completely derailing myself. But you can't stop doing the work that you did while you were abstaining, Mm -hmm. which is paying attention to, you know, if you just abstained and that was the only rule you followed and you didn't do anything extra, like you have been doing for the past 12 years, 12 years, right? Mm -hmm. 12 years. Like you've been every single day you work on, your mental and physical 
and emotional health. Like you're doing that constantly. If you stopped doing that, you might have a different relationship with substances in general. For sure. For sure. So in a second, I want to talk about what people can do with this practically. But first, let's talk about how we know that we are one or the other. How do you know that you're a moderator? I think I flux. Like I think I, I think I definitely flux, but I think it's kind of the same as what we, what we've been talking about. Like I pay attention to how I feel. Recently, I'm currently six months pregnant and at the beginning of this pregnancy, I would have some sweets, like we would go for ice cream and the ice cream would lead my thoughts to be filled with, I want mac and cheese now and I want french fries and I want a hamburger and it just like spiraled and I was, I noticed that and then I had a conversation with you about it, like, hey, I'm noticing that as soon as I have ice cream, like all I want to do is just throw every healthy eating habit that I have out the window and it's like polluting my mind. Like I can't stop thinking about it. And then we haven't had sugar really in a really long time, probably like a couple months. And I feel like that's been really helpful for me to stay healthy during pregnancy. But I don't feel like that when I'm not pregnant as much. So I've just done so much work on my own nutrition and fitness. And I, I'm not saying that to say that you can't start wherever you are. I think it's just to start paying attention to, don't just, don't just go through the motions, pay attention to how you feel around food or how you're behaving around food. Or when you feel like you're not in control, don't just chalk it up to, oh, you know, that was just one day. It's like, be an inquiry. Mm -hmm and ask questions about it. Or I talk to you about it. I come to you and I'm like, hey, right now I'm feeling like I just want to eat like crap and I don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. I think I talk about it. And there's definitely, I've definitely leaned more, the more work I've done, the more I was able to be a moderator because I feel like I'm confident in my ability to make promises to myself and follow through on them. Sweet. And then I feel like at this point, at this point in my life, I am more of an abstainer with something like sugar because I've gone almost, an, I, I went almost the entire year last year without having any added sugar whatsoever. And then got off and like stopped the challenge. And then I was good for like a month. And then I was right back to where I was. And when I am not the way that I want to be with sugar, it's like I'm having some sugar every night. And then there's times where I just, I just binge and I just eat so, like a disgusting amount of sugar, like way more sugar than any human being needs. It's so much like when I would use drugs in the past, like just I'm almost I'm almost doing it until I'm disgusted with myself. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and with drugs, it would be until I black out or, um, you know, I'm just completely inebriated. I would just eat until I'm kind of disgusted with myself and I feel terrible. And it's just to chase this dopamine response that sugar gives you. So I do really well with, with abstinence in certain things and not, it just frees up so much mental energy for me to say, okay, I'm not going to have this thing. I don't know, for a set amount of time or what's working really well right now is this is just indefinitely like I may, I may just continue this trend for, I don't know, for the rest of my life. We'll see. Yeah. Well, also to add to that though, you're, you are from having spent that like basically the whole year last year, um, abstaining, you now have the skills to be able to consciously decide when you're going to have sugar and when you're not like example, it's my birthday tomorrow. We're going to have cake. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a piece of cake. And right after that's done, I bet you go back to abstaining again. Mm -hmm. So I think that that within itself shows you that you learned how to remove yourself enough from it to be able to be much more conscious on is eating this right now contributing or is it taking away? Mm -hmm. And tomorrow we're going to be with some friends and we're going to have some cake and you're going to love it and you're going to be happy that we did it. (laughs) So what can people do with this information? How can they use it practically? I think that to use this information practically, first, I think people should be in inquiry. Think about, think about, are you a moderator or are you an abstainer? Maybe take some opportunity to have conversations with people about it, talk about it, and don't be quick to be in one category or another. Understand that it is in flow and that 
just the paying attention. But you too, you, what do you think people can do? Um, I think what's been really helpful for me is to try both ways for an extended period of time and just to really check in on how they felt and also just watch what happened, like what I actually ended up eating. You know, at times I would try to moderate and it would go well for a week. And then before I know it, I'm just out of control with whatever whatever it is. Even like on keto, I, I crushed it for a while, but then I just started eating way too much steak and, and fat and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So I need, I need more, I do well with more rules and abstaining from, from certain things. So, but it took a lot of experimentation to get to this point where I f- have the self-awareness to say that. Mm-hmm. I think it has really helped you to have a sounding board for that. Like you have me and you also have a coach that mm-hmm. you work with and you have this place where you go to be in reflection on what are the decisions I'm making? How are they making me feel? And what are the next action steps I can take? So you can be in that experimentation without, it's not like a couple days here and a couple days there. Like you're trying things for a significant period of time to find what works for you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. How can people that are in relationships and one is different than the other, one person's an abstainer, the other is a moderator, how can they navigate that? Like for instance, you know, one person wants to abstain from eating ice cream or sugar altogether, but the other person wants to have a little bit every single night and they're totally fine having just a little bit. How can they navigate it so that both people are, can work towards their nutrition, their fitness health goals? Yeah. You probably have some great advice on this too, but I'll just start first and then you can chime in. This is an active conversation to be having in your relationship And I think there's one realization that a lot of people can have when they're managing compromise in in this type of – in all of your relationship is that making a compromise in this situation is not actually for your partner. I think that people need to realize that reaching that compromise is also for you. So let's say I'm the person who wants to have ice cream every night and I'm totally fine with it and you don't want to have ice cream every night and you being with me watching a TV show while I'm eating ice cream is really difficult for you and it either it either leads to you eating ice cream when you don't want to or it makes it harder for you to achieve your goals. Me making a compromise and saying, you know what, I'll just go out two nights a week with my girlfriends and have ice cream on those nights or I'm going to have ice cream at a different time when we're not together and be very conscious and careful about when I'm around you, that's also for me. It's not just for you because you achieving your goals and feeling in control of your nutrition has you showing up as a better husband Mm -hmm. and better in our relationship and you're happier and that then contributes to my life. I want you, it helps me for you to to be that way. So it's really not a sacrifice on my part. I would rather you show up in the relationship your as your best self and have that than be able to have ice cream every single night. Mm-hmm. It's not this like huge sacrifice that I'm making for you. I'm actually doing this for me. Right. Yeah, it's for the relationship, which is for both of you. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So I do think that there is having open conversations and figuring out what's okay and what's not okay. Like are you okay? Just asking questions and being – curious like when does it bother you could I could I have ice cream with my lunch instead like would that satisfy me and I don't eat lunch with you but when we're sitting and watching tv together if that's really hard for you consider that although it might seem kind of annoying in in one moment I could totally see a partner being like man like I just want to eat ice cream at the end of the day like why is it such a big deal like you don't have to have ice cream consider that it might just be really hard for your partner and that's really difficult and you can make things easier for them and you can help them achieve their goals and you can help them be a better version of themselves and I feel like that's kind of your responsibility being in a relationship with somebody yeah I had something to add but before that I had this visual of like uh, a midday ice cream seems like a <laughs> it seems like a midday cocktail. It's like so faux pas. I mean, you're having a midday ice cream. Yeah, I mean, you gotta do what you gotta do. Oh, you got to. You got to. <laughs> I think another useful thing is just to be. I don't know. Like in and at times in in the past, I've struggled with my nutrition so much, 
And I've just come to you and I've been so honest with like, this is a, I, you know, like how I feel about myself. I feel really insecure. I feel like some shame about it because I run a nutrition coaching company and I'm just really honest about my emotions and the impact that not having this dialed in is having on me. And we together talk about the impact that it's having on the relationship. And I think that approaching it in that way can make it so much, I think it's made it easier for you to to like do everything you can to help me, right? Yeah. You see the impact it's having on me personally, on our relationship, rather than me just like making you wrong for having ice cream. For sure. On your end of the side, so in this example, Michael is the person that wants to abstain. And if he came to me and he said, when you eat ice cream, I can't follow my goals. Or I would like, I can you not eat ice cream around me because – it makes me eat ice cream. That I, I might have a different reaction if you had come to me that way because then you're like blaming me for something that's going on with you and we both know that we're responsible for our own behaviors and actions and we can support each other. But if you made it my fault that you're eating ice cream, I, I might not like that. Right, right. So if you're really asking for support, try and speak from your personal perspective. Like what are you feeling why is this difficult for you? And remind your partner, like saying the words, I'm not saying what you're doing is wrong. This is just making me, this, I am feeling insecure and triggered or whatever it is that you want to say. I think that's really helpful. And maybe just saying, will you help me? And then mm -hmm. together brainstorming what that could look like. Yeah. So you're like co-creating the plan. Totally. Totally. So I don't necessarily have a list of action steps that people can take, but I do think that one, you don't have to pick being an abstainer or a moderator. It could be cool to try one and try the other and pick a period of time that you're going to try it for. You can also try them for different types of things, abstain or moderate from chocolate or ice cream or, you know, whatever it is that you feel like you need to take a break from and see how you feel. Uh, then I think number two, have conversations about what you're feeling. Like Michael always says to me, it's better to talk to a wall than nothing at all. So whether it's journal about it or talk to somebody about it so that you can sort through what it is that's actually going on for you. And then three, talk to anybody that you're spending the most time with. So those are the people that are going to be the, the biggest supporters in your life. And if every one of your friends drinks beer every single weekend and you want to be abstaining from beer, having a conversation with them, like, hey, I still want to hang out with you. And I also don't want to drink beer. So how do we make this work? I think those three things would lead you in a good direction. Agreed. Cool. Thanks, guys. Peace. Thanks for joining us. Stay in touch by signing up for our newsletter at workingagainstgravity.com or on Instagram at workingagainstgravity. And don't forget to subscribe to us on iTunes, leave us a five-star review, and refer a friend. We'll be back next week with another episode. Talk to you then.